Uh, tough to be the last speaker uh, on a panel in which the, all the three previous speakers uh, gave very thoughtful uh, presentations and made uh, many of the points that I had hoped to make. So uh, I'll uh, t I have cut out a lot of things that I had in my notes. I want to just to say for kind of context, uh, uh, three sets of experiences over the last 30 years that have affected how I think about these issues. One, uh, David Cohen and I did research in the mid-1980s trying to understand why the great number of public school districts that had tried a merit pay, almost all of them dropped merit pay within five years, like 99%. The, but there were a few that uh, retained merit pay and whether there was enough, enough money uh, involved to um, uh, matter in some sense. And we tried to understand, well, what was the characteristics of those merit pay plans? So that was what we did 30 years ago. Also, f since then, I've, uh, as a labor economist, I ha have studied uh, compensation systems in a variety of occupations and have tried to understand what are the kinds of occupations in which pay for performance endures. And I want to suggest those are very different looking occupations than, than uh, teaching. Uh, and third, uh, I've been working with the Boston Public Schools for the last uh, three months, uh, trying to help them to figure out how to support schools better. And in that capacity, I've spent uh, kind of a day a week in high poverty middle schools uh, observing instruction. And, that, and from that, I've learned a great deal as these schools uh, struggle to uh, help children to acquire the skills that they'll need to take the PARC exam, which uh, you know, is the common core aligned exam, which all uh, Boston students will take in the spring, that um, uh, will examine uh, conceptual understanding of mathematics in ways that uh, has not been the part of prior exams that they've taught, a major challenge. So I've learned a lot from these things. Now, basically, I think um, performance-based pay has many definitions. And if you define it narrowly as, as paying teachers who have basically the same job definition, a, a differential amounts based upon student test score gains in the prior year, I would argue that does not have promise for improving uh, public edu education. And the basic reason is it's contrary to uh, findings of research about what it takes to have a school function well as an organization to serve kids well, particularly poor kids and particularly in these days of, of uh, with Common Core. Uh, standards being uh, endorsed uh, by you know, the majority of, of the nation states. I, I think I can best illustrate this with uh, a four minute video that I want to show you. And this is one of three videos that Greg Duncan, my co-author, and I c c commissioned the public television station in Boston to produce for us that are aligned with uh, the themes of our book, uh, recent book, Restoring Opportunity. If this or the other videos interest you, one's about pre-K, one's about charter schools in Chicago, I'm going to show you part of one that's about small high schools of choice in New York City. And these are high schools that have been effective in increasing the graduation rate among low-income uh, children by 15 percent, by 15 percent. This is a remarkable accomplishment given the size of, uh, of New York City. These, all these videos are available on our website, restoringopportunity.com. Now, before we looked at the video, I want to mention to you that what's the problem here? Well, there are about 200 small schools of choice in small high schools of choice in New York City, and about 150 of them have no academic entrance requirements. They're available to, 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 to anyone. One consequence of this is that most of these uh, small high schools of choice uh, have ninth graders entering, where about a quarter of those ninth graders are reading a third and fourth grade level, not nearly well enough to do high school work. And the faculties of these small schools have come to realize unless they dramatically increase the reading and literacy and writing skills of these ninth graders, they have absolutely no hope of graduating. And that this has to be the challenge, the work, 
for the whole ninth grade teaching team. Well, how do they make that happen? So I want to look at, to show you now this uh, four minute video. The Urban Assembly School for Law and Justice is a small school in downtown Brooklyn. We have about 454 students and a cap of about 120 students in our incoming freshman class. What I think we did well in New York City was not only to create smaller units of school, small schools, but to look at the variety of systems that intersect with school. It's really a grand act of redesign of what we think about as secondary education. One of the untold stories of the small schools is that we required every school to begin with a community partner. We have a really strong partnership with our founding partner, which is a law firm in Manhattan. In ninth grade, the students have multiple opportunities to go there and to really think about the law and being a lawyer. We did a trial where we talked about cases and we did the the uh, defendant and the uh, prosecutor, and we've got to see real life lawyers display that case as well. When you have the support of the community, I think it makes for a richer learning environment. So this whole theme of law, justice, speaking up for yourself, they're very interested in. Literacy is a huge component of our ninth grade here. We have students who come in multiple grades below grade level. So we really think about building a year that has explicit literacy strategies throughout every unit and that builds upon previous units. Daniel, can you remind us what the pre-reading procedures are? All right, what are the predictions you can make about what this would be about? The skills of annotation and analysis and questioning in an English class work in a science class. They're just annotating and analyzing different things. Some hair can be uh, sticking off of the Slide, that's not a problem. Literacy is your ability to understand the content that's in front of you and make connections. But look at that tiny piece, look. Oh. See, look, keep looking and I'm gonna move it, look. See it? It's not focused. Is it lightly or tightly? The literacy strategies that are used, not only do they translate from subject to subject, but they also allow students to use literacy in a completely different way. So what did you add to your definition? Two sides are congruent in the included angles. We have the agenda in front of us. Um, we're going to try to keep the time. In grade team meetings, we discuss what's called Kid Talk, where we present a certain student and we figure out how they're performing and how we can make them more successful here at the school. Today, I was requested to submit an activity that I would be giving students in my class. This is designed to help students go through the scientific thinking and writing that is involved when you are putting together a lab report. And one student that we were discussing is in one of those classes. We're gonna break up into two different groups. And then what you should be doing is having a 10 minute conversation of how this can be modified. Each teacher in the team meeting gave me specific feedback on where I can make certain modifications to help this student and any other student access the material a little bit more. A lot of those skills that were used before can be used here in other content areas. We're teaching kids how to break down information, right? We're teaching them how to use scaffolds, how to be critical thinkers. The student benefits from having some things read aloud, so whether that's in a small group with a teacher, one-on-one, -on -one, that's another alternative modification. That experience for me was, was very genuine. We are all here to help every student that's in front of us, so therefore I take the criticism extremely well. Next week, bring in work that you've modified. So thinking about some of the work that we've done today and applying it to a different assignment or taking loosely some of these ideas and applying them. Okay. 
Thanks for your attention. Uh, so I'd suggest um, it's this kind of collaboration that is absolutely necessary to uh, educate our students well, particularly students that in schools uh, uh, that serve high percentages of poor kids. And basically, you know, instruction has to be more than simply good. It has to be coherent across teachers, across grade levels, and it has to be consistent. Having the, a fifth grade teacher uh, teach a particular having a skill having to do with fractions and decimals in a different manner than the fourth grade teacher uh, teaches it confuses kids who are struggling enormously, which is particularly a problem uh, when their parents lack the knowledge or the time to be able to help uh, unpack that confusion. So I think this is something that is central, this trying to make instruction consistent and coherent, and it takes that kind of planning. So it's critical in thinking about compensation, and clearly that's a piece of a larger plan, as Rob would describe, to create both organizational uh, structures and uh, compensation that uh, facilitates that kind of in-depth cooperation. So let me just say in conclusion, uh, uh, we clearly need new compensation systems. Uh, currently, uh, providing extra pay for master's degrees does not make any sense. The vast majority of studies show teachers with master's degrees are no more effective than those with not. It doesn't mean teachers should be paid less by any means. But it, the problem with master's degrees is it created incentives for lots of post-secondary educational institutions to create relatively undemanding programs that didn't enhance the skills the teachers are able to, uh, to work with in the classroom. So it's not that professional development doesn't matter when done well, which is rare, as Shimon pointed out, uh, uh, it does make a difference, but very, very few master's degrees contribute to that. So in conclusion, uh, kind of a few points, clearly details of implementation matter enormously, as Rob uh, uh, and Matt have pointed out. So, uh, for example, and it's worth thinking in time, does the particular plan you have in mind increase incentives for the kind of collaboration that you saw in the, in the four minute video? Because that's what it's going to take, particularly to improve education in high poverty school. You want to pay attention in an evaluation to long run consequences rather than simply short run. As teachers begin to understand how a plan works, you would expect long run their reactions to it in the long run to be quite different than in the short run. You want to pay close attention to the reactions of highly effective teachers. Uh, you know, what, as, as I think Shimon pointed out, what they, they want to be well paid. Everybody wants to be well paid, not because they're maximizing it, because they have bills to pay in their lives. But most of all, professionally, they want to make a difference. They want to be effective in, in improving kids' chances in life. This is why they got into this. So it's worth thinking about whether a particular compensation plan increases the chances for the very best people to feel they're making a, a difference. And finally, uh, don't confuse the problem of attracting, supporting, and retaining highly effective teachers with the problem of, of, of um, uh, either improving the performance of teachers who are not effective or having them leave if, if even after support they don't improve their performance. I think those, those are quite different problems, and oftentimes uh, uh, we confuse them. And finally, you know, keep in mind uh, improving education by dismissing ineffective teachers who have not been successful in improving their performance, even with a lot of support, that's only going to work if teaching is an attractive occupation to talented college graduates who have lots of career options. And we're not there yet in most places. Let's thank the panel for their contribution.